Greetings, friends. We're here with the Why on Earth Thought and Action Leadership Series, and it is my pleasure to introduce our guest, Nancy Tuckman, who joins us from uh, Loyola University in Chicago. And Nancy is the founding director of the Institute of Environmental Sustainability there, and has also been playing a leading role in the thinking and the implementation uh, connected to Pope Francis Laudato Sea work around stewardship and sustainability. And uh, Nancy, it's such a pleasure to have this opportunity to chat with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Nice to be here. Great. Well, and I thought we might uh, frame our conversation today by first talking about uh, Jesuit universities and, you know, what makes them a bit different from some of the other universities out there. Obviously, there are a good number of Jesuit universities here in the United States as well as internationally. And uh, would you speak to that a bit just to give folks an idea of, of what we're talking about? Sure, absolutely. Um, in the U.S., we have 28 different Jesuit colleges and universities. Um, it's a pretty good sized network, but internationally we have over 200 Jesuit colleges and universities. So it really ends up being the largest network of universities on the planet. Um, That's amazing. Mm. Well, and we know, we, we know some of them are uh, pretty well known as being pretty good at basketball, right? Schools <laughs> like Gonzaga, Georgetown, of course, Loyola. That's right. Um, That's right. And these are also some of the leading institutions when it comes to uh, research and other uh, social sciences work that's being done around these big complex uh, challenges we face in terms of sustainability. Yes, I, you know, I think most universities are really working with these big problems, but the Jesuit universities are unique in that their entire mission is about justice, about social justice, and how, how do we um, affect change that can raise people out of poverty and, and really impact people who are living at the margins. So with that kind of a focus, the environment is really a part of that because, um, of course, as we deplete our environment, it really directly impacts the people at the margins and, and people who are poor before it impacts anyone else. So the Jesuits have really embraced environmental justice as being a big part of their mission. It's so important. I was recently talking with our mutual friend, uh, Father Mark Bosco, who's a Jesuit, and was actually one of the uh, teachers I had way back in high school. Oh. And he was sharing with me that he's actually going to be working with some Syrian refugees uh, later this year. And, you know, that's one of the areas, uh, groups of people and geographic areas that's making the news quite a lot lately and some of that news being so very sad and I think one of the things that a lot of my friends anyway don't necessarily realize is, is a lot of what appears to be simply uh, political or economic uh, instability or disruption around the world also often has very deep environmental or ecological causes at play. And, and now we know that there are as uh, a, a great number of refugees all around the world, uh, so great a number, a, a number we haven't seen since World War II. And so many of these folks are being uh, dislocated, displaced, having their lives literally up, upheaved by some of the environmental uh, tragedies that we're dealing with right now. Absolutely, and, and Syria is such a good example because we do think about it as a, a political war, um, but it was really induced by an extremely long period of drought, which was um, a result of global climate change. And so with this long, long period of extended um, dryness in Syria, people that lived on the land could no longer feed themselves and their children, and so they all began to move into the cities. And it was that conflict of, you know, all these people migrating into the cities all at once 
that started the the Syrian war and those kinds of things cause refugees as you as you described um, and all over the world this is happening with extended floods and droughts and natural disasters that are happening at, at, um, more frequently and more intensively because of climate change absolutely yeah what are you what are you finding that Jesuit universities are are doing that might be a bit different from some of the other secular universities around the country or around the world well first of all Jesuit universities don't deny climate change. And so it's really easy to, to start pulling that into the curriculum because we all believe this is a very important thing for us to be raising awareness, you know, with our students and um, really teaching them about the impacts of, of things like climate change and the loss of biodiversity and some of the other major threats to the planet. So I would say what Jesuit universities are doing is they're, they're working to integrate lessons of environmental sustainability into the curriculum and across the curriculum so that every student that goes through these universities ha has a certain level of literacy around environmental issues you know no matter what their major is they still understand environmental issues and how that impacts them and how it impacts um, humanity so i would say that jesuit universities are doing quite a bit in terms of teaching and and also um, integrating into this this type of issue into their research um, and maybe another unique thing about the jesuit universities is that you know the jesuits work through primarily through education both higher education and secondary education i mentioned earlier that there are about 200 jesuit universities around the planet but there are 2500 jesuit high schools so it's really an enormous um, body of um, you know, edu education. It's such a big education platform that we can really affect change with our students. So it's not only the teaching that we're doing and the research that we're doing, but it's the advocacy and the connection to um, communities. Absolutely. You know, um we were recently, you and I were both at the climate summit hosted by St. Louis University, which of course is also a, a Jesuit school. And I've been to several uh, climate related, sustainability related conferences over the years, as I know you have as well. And one we of the, them. what's that? We see each other there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> One of the things that really strikes me as being different about the the tone, the tenor, the dialogue, the exchange that goes on at some of the Jesuit settings is that it's okay to talk a bit more about our spiritual relationships with earth, with place, with one another. It's not only okay, it's encouraged mm -hmm. that we are, yes, focusing on data, on mind, on important and complex problems from a technical perspective, but we are also really focusing on our heart and our mm -hmm. passion for one another and for our living planet, and that that is increasingly uh, defining, I would say, the narrative and the discussions that are occurring within the Jesuit context, which I happen to believe is, is really important and uh, actually great for folks to be able to experience. Yeah, you know, I love that about the Jesuits, that they, they aren't um, bashful to talk about human spirituality and what an important role that has in the decisions that we make, political, social, environmental decisions. Um, if you're disconnected from your own heart and your own spirituality, then you tend to make you know, decisions only out of your frontal cortex, and it, it, doesn't always, um, it doesn't always do the best for humanity or for the, for the common good. I think that's one thing I love about the Jesuit education is they really talk about you know, the whole person how do we educate the whole person, not just their intellect? So not just teaching facts and teaching, you know, figures, but but really engaging 
the the mind the heart and the body in this whole person kind of an education it really makes for a fun way to educate a rich way to educate and i think it's a terrific way for students to learn to really be able to engage their whole selves into these issues yeah absolutely well i i, I know you and i have talked uh together about how so much of of what we're working on is a matter of holistic uh understanding and, and action from our own lives to our service and roles in our communities and, and around the world and, and i totally agree that uh, it seems the the context that is set within jesuit education allows us to really a approach that in a 360 degree kind of way that uh, seems to to work oh, well <laughs> yeah well we know that there's incredible thought leadership now occurring throughout the world with the leadership of Pope Francis, Laudato Si, um, care of our common home. Uh, many really exciting and laudable examples in Jesuit universities and high schools, I would say all around the, all around the country, all around the world. But I'd love to take a few minutes to focus on the things you all are doing at Loyola Chicago, because I've had the opportunity to visit a couple times this past year, and it has really struck me that the sustainability efforts and discussions are not sidebars at Loyola Chicago. They are really front and center, even in terms of the layout of the campus and some of the special uh, buildings and projects you all have going on. So maybe you could share, share with us about that. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's always fun to talk about um, the progress that we've made at Loyola has sort of been in two, two avenues. One is really greening our campus so that our buildings are more sustainable, they're more energy efficient, so that we're using less water and conserving water and, and our stormwater doesn't go right down the sewer but actually is retained in the soils. Um, we've done a lot with putting on green roofs in our buildings. Um, we've replaced a lot of old, very inefficient buildings with new LEED certified buildings. So this process of sort of greening our campus has taken us, it's been about a 15 year journey. Um, and it's really been exciting because every year we, we do more than we did in the previous year. And yet we have really, um, done a terrific job on our main campus in Chicago and we have a second campus in Chicago that's called our water tower campus that's right down in the loop and both of those have really become much more green in fact this main campus that that you visited um, our Institute of Environmental Sustainability we've been able to decrease our environmental footprint by over 50 percent over these past 15 years and that's enormous you know, that's better than any other school that I know of. Um, certainly the best in the Midwest, and um, we're leading with the Jesuit universities as well. So that's been an inspiration to our students, but also to our faculty, staff, and administration. What can we do next? You know, what about our landscaping? What about our food system? Um, and our waste, of course, and our consumption. So all these different buckets of sustainability have been um, areas where people have really gotten involved in figuring out how we can do better. So that's exciting because it helps to affect change in your own life and your own behavior and the way that you make choices about what you buy and, and, and the waste that you produce. So that's one of the um, directions that we have really been uh, pursuing on this campus. But then of course the other one is our main line of business, which is education. And we have been very intentional about integrating sustainability and en environmental degradation um, awareness into our curriculum. Um, every student at the university has to take a certain number of credits that we call our core, our university core curriculum. And the, the introductory science course that every student has to take is a course that talks about um, these in, uh, issues of the environment through a lens of science. 
And so they learn about climate change and they learn about the acidification of the ocean and the nitrogen pollution problem and um, the loss of biodiversity, et cetera. So I, I feel like that one thing probably has the biggest impact on our campus in terms of raising awareness. The fact that every student, regardless of their major, has to take this core foundational science course, which is about environmental justice and environmental issues. Um, of course, and then we also launched the Institute of Environmental Sustainability in, in 2013. We're five years old this year in August, so that's kind of a fun anniversary for us to celebrate. And we have um, developed curriculum at this point only to the undergraduates, but now we're moving into graduate programming. And it, it is very exciting because these are things that students want to learn about. They want to be part of the solution. So they want to come and, and, and be well educated in their undergraduate um, degrees so that they can go out to be change agents. And we've seen our numbers of students really increase. Um, you know, from when we started just five years ago, we've incrementally increased the number of students that are majoring with us. Um, and now we're up to about 350. So we're growing and very much enjoying working with these young minds. They have a, a lot of energy and um, a lot of motivation to, to do good work and to do innovative work. Oh, absolutely. Well, congratulations on the, on the five-year anniversary and also on those numbers. That's, that's tremendous impact that uh, you and your colleagues are having. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Are other Jesuit universities also uh, making similar environmental uh, courses required regardless of major? Yes, this is something that many of the Jesuit universities are doing. Um, they're doing it certainly within majors, but also some of them are putting it into their core curriculum as well. And I think, I think that's a really terrific way to start because it is a big impact you know, on, on just that one course. Um, we also see a lot of the Jesuit universities really building their campuses to be more green and building um, sustainability committees that have faculty, staff, and administrators so that they really have a, a more integrated approach to greening their campus. Um, you know, it's difficult because if you really want to make a big change on your campus, you have to put a, a financial investment into upgrading your buildings and your heating and cooling systems. Um, but there are so many things that you can do in the curricula that don't really require more money. It just requires a lot of work to change, you know, the way that the curricula, the curricula is, is presently designed. So we see people trying to, you know, go after those low hanging fruits when they just start their sustainability planning on campus. But then once they find success there and they see the student interest and involvement, it kind of, keeps them going and um, that's been a really exciting trend across the universities. Well, that's so cool. Well, it makes me think a little bit about the, the work we're doing with the, the Why on Earth community yes. and our sort of two-pronged approach where on the one hand we are discussing and uh, working toward uh, getting active around solutions for sustainability, for stewardship, and then on the other hand we're really encouraging folks from varieties of backgrounds, ages, and so forth to uh, cultivate that thriving practice in our own lives, our own homes, where we're, we, we go to these five themes, we can count them on our hands, where uh, we're working with soil, with food and drink, we're working with movement, we're working with connection with nature, we're working with well-being practices. And it's so exciting to see with, with folks this increasing level of, of awareness and recognition that, my goodness, so many of the things we can do, I can do in my own life that will enhance my own health, well-being, quality of life are also well aligned with global strategies for stewardship and sustainability. And I think at a place like uh, Loyola, Chicago, this is being uh, not only inculcated with the students in terms of curricula, but is also part of the campus experience when walking around one sees uh, a whole lot of, of effort and resources that have gone into helping connect these dots. Mm -hmm. 
And, and that's a challenge, you know, because we do have a big turnover of people, especially students. They come in as freshmen and they kind of become um, socialized to the culture, the, uh, the sustainability culture that we have on this campus. And then they graduate and we get new students that come in. So it's, it's constantly working with new people and, and trying to socialize them to this idea that this is how we live on our campus and this is how we live in our personal lives as well. Um, but I, I imagine that Why on Earth has uh, the same kinds of challenges, you know, just constantly trying to bring people into the fold and, and um, change habits. Old, old habits die hard. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. We, we, are, we are very focused on habit changing and, and the opportunities that these uh, really present us in our, in our own lives, in our communities, and in our world more broadly. Well, I guess... Can I say something about that? Because yeah. I, I think that you've selected the, the five areas of sustainability that you've selected for Why on Earth are very important because people mm -hmm. oftentimes think, you know, if I make a change, is it really going to matter? It's going to be like a drop in the ocean or a, you know, a grain of sand on the beach. But in fact, it does make an enormous difference difference when each individual makes a commitment to being more sustainable, to consuming less and producing less waste, and to just being conscientious about the food and water and drink that we consume mm -hmm. and where it comes from and how far it travels. Um, so, you know, I've read a lot about this and studied a lot about this, and what keeps coming up in the data is that the one biggest impact that we can have as individuals is to not eat meat. Mm -hmm. And even if you just, you know, sort of reduce meat in your diet um, once a day, if, if you're used to eating meat at all three meals and you go down to two meals a day, that's, you know, that's an enormous, that's a third of the meat that you would be um, otherwise consuming. But, you know, growing um, uh, livestock has just such an enormous impact on, on our um, landscape. And that is one really big thing that people can do. You know, there's lots of others as well. I mean, certainly our consumption of energy, which wasn't in your five, but that's something that kind of goes along with health and well-being if you're riding a bike or walking more than, yeah. than just always taking, uh, taking your car, for example. So anyway, I wanted to just yeah. give you a call out that those are very good um, areas of sustainability that you're focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for mentioning that and sharing that. And, you know, we have uh, friends. We're working in communities really all over, very diverse communities. We have friends who are devoutly vegan. For, for these reasons you're describing. We, we have friends who, you know, maybe grew up, maybe Midwest kind of meat and potatoes culture who are now beginning to think, you know, instead of consuming the industrial meat, I'm gonna focus on some of the other regenerative grass-fed beef, for example, which is part of that soil building carbon sequestration process. And, you know, we try really hard with the work we're doing with Why on Earth not to necessarily create divisions where people are at different points in that spectrum, but to, to invite folks that, to say, you know, look, wherever you are right now, what, what are a few things you can do today, tomorrow, just like you're suggesting, perhaps one third less of something, one third more of something that might be beneficial? Where, where are those levers currently that you can start pulling in your own life that are going to actually not only probably enhance your health, your experience day to day, but also help move this big needle that we all share in our broader society. That's right, absolutely. And you know, you, I'm sure that in your, uh, in your work, Aaron, that you, you're working with families and you probably have young people and children as well. Those are the ones that are so eager to make a change and they find it so easy to do. And they oftentimes teach us adults that you know, giving something up or changing or habit really isn't that big of a deal and that we can do it. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Oh, that's so great. Well, well let, me, let me ask a, kind of a big question as, as a way of maybe wrapping up our discussion today. Uh, with all the work you're doing and, and with your colleagues, the amazing institution and institutions that you're a part of and connected to, if you were to pause and, and think about a big, hairy, audacious goal or something that 
we could stretch for as university campuses or even society more broadly thinking out a number of years. What comes to mind for you? What, what do you think, Nancy, is something we could all be working toward? And not necessarily that we'll prove to one another that we're definitely going to make this happen, but that perhaps we just might. I love that thinking. Yeah, that's very exciting. Um, one direction that we're working with the, the Jesuit colleges and universities worldwide is, you know, they've got the higher ed directorate, the second ed direct, the secondary ed directorate, but then they also have a social justice and ecology directorate. And those three groups of um, people working uh, in the Society of Jesus don't always work across directorates very well, but think of the work that we could get done if the people that are conducting research in universities could be doing research on the field sites where the social justice centers are working with the poor and working in these areas that have had devastation from drought and flood and hurricane damage you know from climate change if the researchers could help inform the people that are in the social justice centers on you know sort of what's coming or how how to respond um i think we could we could leverage one another in a very impactful way and if we think about this you know just bringing it into our own lives and our own communities if, if we're not affiliated with universities i think working in community is a very very important thing because we tend to get so isolated i know i have friends who come to work every day and they do their work and then they rush home and they make dinner and they do their stuff with their family and they come back to work and they don't even really know their neighbors because everybody's doing the same thing. Their neighbors are also, you know, taking off and going to work and coming back home and it's kind of a rat race. But the more we're in place, thinking about the soils that are in our shared, you know, space in our neighborhoods, um, we, we went through a process like this in my own neighborhood where I, people hated my yard because it, it's filled with a lot of native plants and it also has a lot of dandelions in it because dandelions are very good, um, you know, for, for bee forage, honeybee forage. Um, so, but anyway, just talking to people and getting out there and, and, and pretty soon people slowly started not using all the herbicides and pesticides in their yards anymore and you sort of see a lot more diversity in people's lawns they're not just perfect you know green monocultures but actually you know they're starting to see that all these decisions that we make and sometimes we've just been sort of socialized into thinking that perfect green grass is what we all need to have but the more diversity that people are getting in their yards it's helped to build the soil you know, and it's, it's helped to, um, you know, make homes for different types of birds and, and insects and things. So just those kinds of changes that you can make in your own community, not only help the, the landscape and the soil and the water drainage and the diversity um, and the diversity of insects and birds and mammals that you can support in your neighborhood, but really it's the social part of connecting with your neighbors and um, and really having a fuller life that's more sustainable and more about community. I find that really gratifying. Well, that is so beautiful to hear, Nancy, and you hadn't shared that with me before. It just brings a big smile to my face knowing that you're also having this kind of impact in your neighborhood. And we love the dandelions. They're they are so important. One of the early food sources for the bees as they're waking up in the spring. And uh, that is absolutely wonderful. And it's, you know, it's really one of the reasons we're deliberately growing this network of ambassadors all around the country. We're in fact now starting to get international a little bit with that. And uh, turns out we get a lot of benefit from doing this kind of work, this kind of community building it. It is actually something that enhances our, our quality of life. And what a joy that that's part of the work we get to do in these times. That's right. And as we get to know our neighbors better, we can share things so that not everybody has to buy a lawnmower. Yes. <laughs> but you can have one lawnmower and you can have five people sharing it. Or you can have one ladder that all five families can share. And that kind of shared economy is so much more sustainable, but it's also just more rich. It's just a wonderful, you know, way to live. 
Absolutely. You know, this coming weekend, uh, Sunday afternoon, we're going to be meeting at a friend's home, building soil, doing some biodynamic uh, soil prep and biochar uh, activation and planting some plants, getting together and enjoying some sun tea with folks. And, uh, you know, it's it's not glamorous necessarily, but it's a, it's really a lot of fun. And we're in the process actually really starting to enhance uh, soil activity in communities all around. That's fabulous. My son is a biodynamic farmer and beekeeper. <laughs> well, no kidding. Okay, well, Nancy, we're, we're gonna probably have more uh, to talk about, it sounds like. And uh, I, I really appreciate you taking this time out of your busy day. Um, to wrap up, I, I just want to say, Nancy, thank you. I've been speaking with Nancy Tuckman from University Loyola Chicago, where she is the founding director of the Institute of Environmental Sustainability and is doing so much great work in her own neighborhood as well as all around the world through the uh, universities and the Jesuit network. And uh, Nancy, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you, Aaron, and keep up your great work. Will do. You bet. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.